All right, what a great intro. Um, hey, welcome. Um, uh, I just want to make clear that it's just me between you and the beers or the drinks, right? Um, so great that you came um, to this last session of the day. Um, did you have a great day nation so far? All right, like that, like that. Okay, cool, cool. Um, my name is Sven. I work for a small startup called Manfred. Um, basically, we're doing kind of recruiting, but we're turning the recruiting process a little bit upside down. And so actually, we help uh, developers so companies can apply to them instead of you applying to companies. Um, and uh, as I said, we're a small startup in uh, very successful in Spain right now, and we're looking to expanding to other regions. That's just the, the story here. So effective software developers. Um, I've been talking to a lot of software developers. Um, I've been working for companies like Atlassian and MongoDB. So I talk to a lot of senior and junior developers and just like trying to find like how, how can we make developers more effective and what is actually the effectiveness in, in developers. Um, so because you can actually build great tools with decent technology. I mean, you can maybe build a, a great uh, app um, with uh, PostgreSQL database or MySQL database. Um, I know I've been working for MongoDB. I'm a little bit uh, maybe biased in that, in that uh, sense. Um, you can maybe develop it a little bit faster with a MongoDB, but still, it's the same great app that you can build with these technologies. You can use Java, you can use Kotlin, you can use PHP, maybe, I don't know. Um, uh, it's going to be tricky here. Um, so yeah, so let's 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 take a step back and think about like what an effective developer is actually doing, right? So when I think of an effective developer, I think about like they're writing super smart code, code that you actually do normally in 20 lines of code, right? And then they condense that to just five lines or two lines or three lines of code. It's just amazing how effective these these developers are. Um, they're fixing bugs immediately. If you meet them, actually, and you look into your GitHub issues or Jira or whatever you use as an issue tracker, there's a is new issue, a new bug reported over the night. You ask, hey, can someone please fix that bug? Because it's, it's a little bit annoying. Um, so this effective developer raised their hand and says, you know what? I actually uh, saw that yesterday evening already. So I just like fixed it. It's actually uh, on the main branch. So you, I, I submitted it to the main branch directly and it's done, right? They fixing bugs immediately. So it's re really amazing, these effective developers. Um, also, they adding new features, features like a jam. If you stay in the morning in front of the scrum board with them and say, all right, um, this task, um, who's going to do that? And then this effective developer raised their hand and said, you know what, I already did that. You can progress this into, in progress. Uh, actually, you can do it, or it's already done. Super, super effective. Um, and they never stop. They always hacking. You see them always hands on the keyboard, um, always, always doing stuff on the keyboard, always in motion. These effective developers, um, if they have to stop, because maybe they need something from, from the designers or from operations. They just take the next, uh, next task from the, from the uh, to-do list and just work on that. They never stop. They're always hacking. And they, they actually live and breathe code. They know the code inside out. You can actually wake them up in the middle of the night just like say, OK, hey, the web page is a little bit broken. Um, and then this effective developer just says, oh, yeah, well, go to that class, um, that function, change the variable, and it, then it should work. They live and breathe code. They know the code inside out. They care about the code. Um, that was actually me in 2003. Yeah, I know. It's a long time ago. I'm that old dude. Um, it's, it's, I, was, I was three years in my first job, and I felt super effective. It was, I knew the code. I knew everything. And I felt like I am super effective. Uh, people can come to me with tasks and issues, and I will fix it. I'm super effective. Now, almost 20 years later, looking back, I'm, I must say, it's, was I really that effective? 
let's let's take a look at what I just what I just said um, with with the effectiveness that I had maybe at that time. Super smart code, you know, code that is condensed just from ten lines of code into two lines of code. I felt like I know what I'm doing. It's super cool code. Um, but that was, at the moment, of course, super cool, because then I said, oh, please don't touch that code, because actually, at that time, I knew what it was doing, but now I, I know it's, 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 it's doing the right thing, but please don't make me change it. Um, or I was, I was fixing all the bugs, right? Fixing all the bugs immediately. Why did I fix all the bugs? Because I felt embarrassed, actually. I, I, I have bugs in my code? No. So I, I just like fix it, make a, make a fast fix around it. Um, that broke some other things, so I fixed that too. Um, but what I actually should have done is actually I should have taken the time and, and fixed the root problem, right? If I would have taken maybe one day out or two days out, I would have saved time at the end, right? Because I was fixing bugs always and always over and over again. And I actually made things worse sometimes, um, but or un more unstable. So I should have just taken a taken step back and fixed the root problem. Um, adding features like a champ, right? People were tapping me actually in the office on the shoulder and said, Sven, I've just been to this, to this customer, uh, and this customer wants this new functionality um, to download something as an Excel file or so, download the list as an Excel file. So I said, oh yeah, I'm, I can do that. Um, let me just like hack it in and it's done. You know, but I actually created features that get never used or rarely used because this customer never bought the software or this was just the only customer that wanted this functionality. So I actually should have worked on more popular features than just the ones that just like give us the next, the next customer. I should have worked on features that give us the next 10, 100 customers, actually. Um, I never stop, always, always hacking. As I said, like, um, stop, take the next task, wait for the designers to come with the design, and then continue with, 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 the, with, the, with the previous task. Well, that is a lot of context switching. And we need to avoid context switching. If I have to switch uh, between three different tasks each day, then I'm losing time. You know, when you're on the flow and you, get, you need to get into the flow, it takes you up to 15, 20 minutes until you're super productive and you're on the flow. I should have actually asked the designers before I actually uh, started with the task, is your design ready when I need it? Or should I wait with the task? Because it stops and I have to do something else. Um, so, not super effective, actually. And then, live and breathe code. So, I knew the code base inside out. I was caring about the code. It was actually my team's code base, and I, I knew every line of code. Not Maybe not every line of code, but most of it. Um, I felt really, really familiar with the code. But instead of just caring about the code all the time, I should have taken a step back and see the broader view of the whole product that we are building, right? Where is this product going? What features are actually used? Well, how can I improve the product instead of just thinking about code day in, day out? So, as you see, if I would have pushed on the, on the left-hand side here, right, do more of this, I would have been more efficient, right? I would have done I fixed more bugs, I would have maybe added more features, great, very efficient. But actually, effectiveness was more on the right-hand side, right? If I would have caused root problems, that would have been more effective at the end. In other terms, if I would have pushed myself to the left-hand side, I would have worked harder where I actually could have worked smarter. Um, and that's actually also in the title of my talk, uh, work smarter, not harder. Who wants to work harder? No one. Great. Who wants to work smarter? Yeah, that's what I want to see. Great. You're in the right talk. You can stay. No beer yet for you. Um, so let's, let's start with some, some key team code to be more effective, right? We write code as a team. So writing good code takes time. We know that. Writing really good code takes time. And sometimes I was sitting, sitting like this in front of the screen, and uh, my boss came and asked, Sven, what are you doing? Why do you try to optimize the code? Um, the compiler doesn't care, right? And yeah, maybe he's right, right? The, the, the machine doesn't care. Maybe my, my boss was right at the time. Um, but there's one thing, right? 
humans do. It gets compiled to, to, to bytecode and to machine code and get executed by the machine, but humans do. They care about well-written, good code. And this is important because actually we, we read code more often than we write code. So we just like look at code more often than we actually type in code. That's a fact. So you want to just like change something, so you need to just like find the right class, find the right function, try to understand what's going on. Is that the right class? No, it's not. So we read code very, very often. So we, we need to just like train, be trained into reading code so we get the functionality quickly. So if you look at code as this, um, well, I, I, can, I can highlight a few things in there, but as I look at this, I don't really, really get what's going on here. So then I type in git blame, and um, so just like blame the person that wrote that code. And then I found out, oh, it was me. And I remember it. Oh, yeah, it was on a Friday evening. Yeah, I pushed it, uh, to push it on the main branch, and then I left it there, and I wanted to fix it on Monday morning. But you know, Monday morning was some emails in my inbox, and I just like some other stuff had to do. So I totally forgot about it. Sounds familiar? Yeah. Um, done, that, done that several times. So I look at the code and say, oh, there's a lot of stuff wrong here. Just let's do this public, private, protected. What the heck? All the same. Um, print information where we should use camel case here. Um, then all the indents, it's just like wrong or, or messed up. I know a lot of stuff can be fixed here. Just like curly braces on the same line, on the different line. What the hell is going on? Just like this magic number in front of, of the variable or, or just look behind makes me always think like what's going on here. So the, key, the, the code is a little bit not, not readable or just like the variable names, deduction A, deduction B. What does that mean? So we, I know there's a lot of stuff that automatic tools can do, and we should apply them, right? We should apply the same format. And formatting is not just like make it look nice, but it makes the code more readable. And I don't care about like if the curly braces is on the same line or, or, or on, the, on the next line. I don't, I don't care about this right now. Uh, we can have a conversation about that later, but um, it's just like what the eye got trained to. So you need to train your eyes to well formatted code, and you need to format code as a team. It doesn't help if just like one team, team member formats the code different than another team member. You have to agree on something here. It's a little bit like this. The human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. If you look at the code, right, you just like need to, you want to understand what's going on. It's just like if your eyes are trained to it, you just like get it. Okay, I have to fix it here, right there. Um, so, one thing, formatting code as a team. The other thing is like writing clever code. O always, already been there, right? So, why do we write clever code? For me, it was just like, because I can, right? Because I can write clever code, I wanted to show that I do, right? To my coworkers, uh, what, what smart person I am. But it was not good for the team, um, because maybe half of the team didn't understand the code. Even I didn't understand the code after a month or two months. Um, we should always strive for simple code. It is simplicity over cleverness. If you see clever code and you think like, I don't understand it, ask the author to change it, right? To make it more understandable. Because we all in the team are working with the code. It's not just me that works with the code. It's not just this person works with the code. All on the team, we're working as a team on the code. So, question here. Um, is your code simple enough? How do you find that out? Maybe something is, is, is simple for you, but for your coworkers, it's not, right? Maybe not for your junior developers, and that's the thing. You should make the canary test with your code. And the canary test is actually show your code to your newest developers to your junior developers, unexperienced developers, and say, do you know what's going on here? And maybe they don't get everything because they're junior developers and they're still learning. Um, but if they say, okay, kind of I understand what's going on. I don't, maybe with the domain I'm not so familiar with, but I, I, I get it. Then your code is, is simple enough. How do you do that on a daily basis? Sure, code reviews. Who's doing, uh, who's doing, actually, who's, who's reviewing every line of code that gets into, gets into your repository, every change? A few. Okay, cool. Yeah, great. Good to see. Um, so, invest time in code reviews is, of course, to first, like, 
make sure your code is readable. On the other, side, other, other hand, it's like to inspire your, your youngest developers, your junior developers, what's all possible in code. And of course, to ensure different code uh, a, a, a consistent code quality. But it's not just about, about, about that, right? So code review is a little bit hard. We, we, we tend to not do code reviews because we want to, we, I, and I totally understand that, because our code gets in front of our code, our co co uh, of our coworkers, right? So they see actually our code, and they, they just like look at the code and they say, ah, oh, Sven, code not good enough, so they judge our code, and that's hard. That's really hard um, for us because you get immediately feedback about everything that you write. Um, and that can be, can be quite hard. So how can we make code reviews more pleasant? So there are just like a couple of rules that the Bitbucket team has set up for their code reviewers at that time. Um, so they say, first, if you look at the code of a coworker, try to understand why did this person make this decision? What was, maybe there was no other possibility. Maybe um, this person didn't know better. But try to understand, put yourself in the shoes of the, of the author of the, of the code. So that's, that's one thing. Then, next thing is criticize the ideas, not the people. So always just like say, ah, I don't, I don't like that, or, um, but never say like, oh, you're in, or something. Um, never. Never ever do that in, in, in code reviews because this is really dragging people down and that's why we actually don't like code reviews if you have this in your in your in your code reviews comments. And then also don't rant, right? Don't say, oh, this is awful. Because no one is learning from that, right? Just make suggestions. Show people what what they can do or how can they improve the code. This is the way they learn. Uh, they, they learn more about it. Um, and also don't spoon feed. So spoon feed means just like tell them, okay, exchange this line of code with that line of code because people don't learn from that. This is not how we learn. Um, so don't spoon feed. And then also comment on positive things, right? Just be, be positive. People really like that. It says, oh, great idea. That was brilliant. Didn't know that this is possible. So this is just like a few few rules that the Bitbucket team set up to make code reviews more human, more pleasant, however you want to call that, um, to just like have a better feeling about, about code reviews. Make your own whatever works for, for your team. The second thing that I want to talk, talk about is learning, right? Um, learning is, is very important to be an effective developer. And when I just came from from fresh from university in my first job, I was super excited, like, wow, cool, awesome, wow, this is possible in code? I didn't know. Wow, automatic builds? Woo, cool, right? So we are super excited. We are keen to learn something new, right? And somehow this is actually also our industry, super excited. So being here at a conference and see this, new technology, you always think like, wow, cool. Uh, I want that actually in my, in my production code, right? We are so excited about it. Yeah. And then you put it into the production code. And I've done that too and said, oh, wow, I came from conference and said, we need to use it. And then they shut down the library after two years because no one actually else was using it. And then we were just like, and I had all this thing in my, in my, my code base, all these different, different technologies in my code base, right? So over the years, you get a little bit from being super excited about uh, things. So let's say you just like mature a little bit, right? Um, so this is how it goes. And then you, you say things like maybe, you know, I also survived the Microsoft and serverless hype that will go over. Or really, a new front end framework again? That's number 20 on my list. Scrum boards, I know what's important. Yeah, right? You don't have to tell me. Or code review, not for me. My code is perfect. The other code, I want to review, but my code is perfect, right? So with other words, even if that is a little bit like too much, but uh, if you get older and you're longer in this industry, you, you have seen things, right? And you don't want to make the same, same mistake twice of just like ripping out another web framework, front-end framework, and putting in a new one um, instead. So you become a little bit like a grumpy developer. 
Maybe a bit, all right? Not every, uh, no, of course not us, but you probably have someone had in the team that became a little bit grumpy, right? Yeah. We all know these, these developers. And they say, I know how to develop software. Yeah, sure, they know how to develop software uh, now, right? But then ask them the question like, do you think actually software development is changing? And of course it is. It is changing all the time, right? Containers 10 years ago, no one cared about that. Um, so yeah, we are continuously need to learn something new all the time. We are in this continuously learning cycle. This is just our industry, and we have to, have to deal with it. So how do we get updates? So what I do, um, I listen a lot to podcasts and audiobooks. Um, I was doing that when I commuted to work. Um, and during the pandemic, I was not commuting that much. So I was just like working out more. So I during, during running or something, I was listening to, to these things. So just like see what's out there. Don't have to dive deep into technologies, but just like know what's out there so you can grab it when you need it or look at it closer when you, when you need it. Um, thank God this is possible again. Going to meetups, and meetups is not just about learning, but also about like connecting and you doing the right thing. Going to J Nation, great. So please uh, also on the after, after party connect to other people. So actually you build a network, and once you have a problem, you said, Oh, I met this person at this conference. Um, let me just like ask, they, they have the same problem. So also super important. What we did at MongoDB was we were having book club, a book club. So I'm not a big book reader. Um, I'm, I prefer audiobooks. But um, we were actually, as a team, reading a book. And then we read a chapter each week. And then we met for 45 minutes each week and discussed it. And that helped me actually not just to also keep reading um, and concentrate for, I don't know, a chapter, one hour or 45 minutes, um, but also to just like raise my opinion dive deeper into topics and, and start a discussion. That was pretty cool. What I did when I was a team lead, a uh, tech, tech, tech team lead for, for a team, um, I was doing Video Fridays, uh, which was also pretty cool. So instead of just like, we couldn't go to a conference each week, um, so we just like brought the conference into our team room and we were just like voting what talk we wanted to hear or wanted to see. Uh, and then on a Friday afternoon, 3 p.m., uh, we watched a talk and then had a discussion as a team. It's also great because not every team member has actually or is in the in, the, in their life situation to just like have some use their spare time to learn something new or something. So, but just like have the team uh, have to something to learn as a team. But what I hear normally from from junior developers is it's like this: like, why do you learn? Why should we actually learn all these new technologies? If I have a problem, what I do is, yeah, all the answers are already there, right? We don't need to learn something because all the answers are on Stack Overflow. Just copy-paste it. That's not what learning is about, right? We know that. So first, try to solve the problem yourself. It's important because next time you run into a problem, you need to go to Stack Overflow or Google it again. Um, but if you have really understood what the problem was, you don't run into that anymore. Um, so super important. If you don't just like can just like get the answer by try and solving the problem yourself, just like ask for help. But before you run and uh, go to your coworkers and interrupt them, you know I talked about the flow and the context switching. Um, ask yourself for help. That's a technique called rubber ducking, and it, maybe it sounds a little bit stupid, but it really helps. And I'm sometimes doing it. So you can talk to a rubber duck and explain the problem to the rubber duck. The rubber duck always smiles, which is, which is first thing nice and understands what you're saying. Um, but also, you're taking, taking yourself a step away from the deep dive, narrow view problem, but just like broaden your view by talking to the rubber duck, because you, the rubber duck is probably not a domain expert, so you have to explain it a little bit broader. Um, so, and that helps actually also to think about, oh, I could try this. And often, this was actually helping me a lot, uh, I got the answer. But also, if the rubber duck don't help, ask for help, admit that you don't know, don't just like try to just like use days on solving it, just like admit you don't know. Because actually learning makes new connections in our brain, we know that, no connections, we can use that later. But it's not just about learning. Um, 
It's also we need to learn um, to unlearn and get rid of some connections. Because some things that we learned in the past is not true anymore, right? When I was at university, I was learning like waterfall methods to develop software. That's the way to go. Right? We know that this is probably not the best way. We're all agile nowadays, and uh, people convinced me that I also should look into agile. Um, so um, we need to learn to unlearn. Some things are not true anymore that we learned. A super important thing. Otherwise, we become this grumpy developer that says, I know everything. I know, kid. Um, I know everything. Um, also, if you dive deeper and you become more senior, just like use your knowledge and become a mentor and help your Unity developers. That makes you actually pretty, pretty effective uh, because the Unity developers will solve the problem. So how do you do that? Um, so first, like become a mentor. Tell, tell someone, I can be your mentor. Um, listen to people, right? Listen to what they, they, they say and just don't, don't come up with the answer immediately. Instead of just like asking questions, um, also, give them maybe if you see like, okay, they don't know where they're going, so give them just directions. Same as with, with code reviews, right? Um, don't rant, make suggestions. Also here, just like you give them a little bit of direction. And what is super important is not come back if you don't, if, if you, if you don't solve it. We have a session again in, in one week. Come back then. No, have an open door. So just like be open. So this person just like feels, feels like, they can always come back to you and, and ask you questions. Um, also super important. And the thing is, when you do that, you're surprised about the answer. If you think, OK, I know actually how to solve that problem. And why does that person really don't know, don't, don't see that, or don't go that way? They come sometimes up with, with other ways. And you'll be surprised, actually. You'll be surprised that there are different solutions to the problem, and not just your solution is the right one. The other solution is maybe even, even better. So actually, becoming a mentor is not just like giving on your knowledge, but it's also you learn something from that. Um, so learning, continuous learning, continuous unlearning. And also, if you, as I said, if you become more senior, please also use your seniority as advising people. But there's one, uh, one, one important ingredient missing here in that formula, um, and this is experimentation. We need to try things out. We can't just not learn from books or from podcasts or from videos. Um, so experimentation. We need to experiment. But your boss might say, yeah, why? Um, all your tasks that you have to do is already on the scrum board. There's no task experimentation. It's all on the scrum board, right? Um, and you just have to work through through the board, right? Okay, it's not all on the scrum board because it doesn't fit. So the rest is somewhere in the backlog in Jira. You know that everything is in Jira. So, but you also might know that this one one thing like that might not be the best idea, or maybe there is something on the board that might not be the best idea, and you can't point at what it is. But you know that everything that is on the board can't be right, can't be can't be the best idea. So saying you have known unknowns. Like, I mean, if you, if you know, like, maybe there's a better solution out there. Maybe that's not the best solution that is on the board. Maybe actually there's a new technology that could help us. We are reinventing the wheel here. There's always already something out there, but we don't know it. Or even we're working on the wrong things. It's not, we shouldn't work on these things. We're missing some opportunities here. I can just like say 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 one sentence of that. Um, don't be shy. Just try. Try things out. Um, get your get your hands dirty. So uh, what also what 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 we did uh, was we were doing um, taking one and a half hour each week off, and we did coding sessions. So we were learning a new coding language, a new programming language that we weren't using at work. We were not supposed to use it at work, but we wanted to. So we take, took one and a half hour from our work time off to learn something new, uh, just to see like, how things are done with maybe TypeScript, um, if you want to go into that. Um, so try, try that. And the good thing is you take the time off as a team. So the whole team actually is engaged and uh, take, takes the time off. So one half hour of coding means uh, one half hour of improving. Great. But also, you should. Look at your tools, right? You have probably 20, 30 different kind of tools that you use. 
Do you use them effectively? Do you know actually if you use all the features that are possible and that could help you, or maybe a new update brought new functionality and you weren't following up? So also just like invest time and just like learning your tools or learning new tools. If you use Jenkins, maybe GitHub Actions uh, is, is, an, is an option. Just try it, try it out and see how, how it works. Uh, or if you, if you maybe you want to try some IDEs, cloud IDEs like, like Gitpod, where there are pre-built uh, dev environments in the cloud, um, so pre-compiled for you. Maybe you try it out. It's, these tools are normally always have a free layer, so you can try it out. Um, so let's say invest half an hour, hour a week, or maybe one hour a week, up to you. That's two hours of improving. But what we really want is like missing opportunities, right? Maybe you're missing something that we don't know that would help us actually to build better software, to build, build better products. And that's innovation. Every company wants innovation. The problem with innovation is, is never that you, you're lacking ideas. I have tons of ideas. My coworkers have tons of ideas. The problem with actually innovation is that we don't have time to try it out, to see is that really something that would fly or that works or that people would really want, right? That's the problem actually that we have. So, if the pro problem is the time, so how much time would you need? Maybe 40 hours, right? Actually, that's what MongoDB does. MongoDB takes off two times a year, 40 hours, so a week, to work on some problems or to work on some new ideas. They call it skunk work, so the whole engineering team, design team, uh, takes time off to, to work on, on something that they wanted, wanted to get solved. Maybe you need 30 hours. But maybe you just need 24 hours. Um, that's actually what Atlassian does. They do this 24-hour hackathons. Actually, they were the first, uh, one of the first that invented these 24-hour hackathons back in the days. They called it at that time um, FedEx days. So you get it, FedEx, deliver in 24 hours. So you had to deliver everything in 24 hours. And that became super popular. So popular, if you Googled FedEx, the FedEx days came up first, so FedEx called Atlassian and said, can you please rename your FedEx days to something more, uh, something different? Um, and then they called it Ship It Days, same concept, to ship something in 24 hours. But um, this is actually a pretty, pretty easy, easy framework that uh, Atlassian set up here. So three phases, the B for the planning phase, super important to plan the dates two, three months before, so everyone can just schedule their off-sites or uh, releases, not at the time of the, of the, of the ship-it day. Then they actually announce and tell stories, so that means that they think about what they wanted to work on before, actually, they're not going into the day and say, well, what are we going to do? So they think about it before, and then they're trying to find teams, because you have more impact as a team, so they're doing this brown bags, lunch talks, where they pitch their ideas and say, oh, we need a designer for just like getting these ideas, and then not everyone has ideas or knows what's doing, and then they can join a team. So, and then on a Thursday afternoon, 3 p.m., the, the ship it day starts. The clock is ticking in the office, there's a big clock that is counting down. Um, have fun because you're working on a problem that really uh, that you want to get solved, and you can do so much in 24 hours if it's really a problem that you think is a problem and that you want to show to the whole company that you can solve it. So you can you have the possibility to show, show it off to the whole company. So it's very engaging. So having fun is, is very imp important, of course. Get energized and, uh, and drink. Don't forget to drink. Um, so, uh, so these are 24 hours, right? So we start at a Thursday, uh, 3 p.m. Most people go home at 10 p.m. maybe or 9 p.m. Um, some people staying, actually, and there's just a few people that really stay for the whole 24 hours, crazy people that sleeps under the desk, but most people come back at 6 or 7 and then continue working on their project, continue working on their presentation, because this is, this is also super important. And then on a Friday, 3 p.m., we are having uh, the presentation. So presenting, each, each team gets three minutes to present their ideas, then we vote, actually, 
actually the voting app is also a project that uh, was developed by the Day. So, and then we announce the winners, have a short celebration because everyone is tired. Um, and then also, some things go on the product road, road, roadmap, but not everything. Um, not everything is just like a great new idea that goes on the product uh, roadmap. And you know what? This is super important because something actually, as I said, get on the product roadmap. And these are just like a minority. But the, the most of them, it's just like, we're not doing it. And this is important. Important is really to know what you shouldn't do, which direction you shouldn't go. It's a super important learning that you have through the ship it day. It's not a waste of time and just like saying, oh, we just like from our ship it days, just like two ideas in the last two years made it into the product. Well, you learned a lot by not shipping, right? Maybe you would have put it on the product roadmap and would have been a failure. So super important that you know what you're not ship. So let's do it every quarter, right? 24-hour hackathons every quarter uh, means 0.7 hours a week. Uh, means 2.7 uh, hours of improvement. But then also you have the known knowns. The, the thing that you know are important, like your cool, great ideas, right? that you want to have in the product, but I don't know, the product manager doesn't see it, have other priorities, but it would really be great to have that in the product. Or you have this, what I call paper cut issues. So um, you probably um, know the term paper cut for small issues that you have. Let's say you have to just like do two steps where you could just like do it in one step, um, but we never have time to fix that. Um, so we leave it in the software, right? Um, it's not important. But these are small paper cut uh, issues that you have in your software. So, and then you, there's a term like death by a thousand paper cuts. So if your software is full of these small things, it felt buggy. You can do whatever you want. You can have the greatest features, but it felt buggy. So fix, fixing those paper cut issues is also important. So how can we do that? So the Bitbucket team came also up with this great idea to run every eight weeks, take one week off, and fix something in the software that isn't really a priority, but it's also important. Like They call it innovation weeks. It's a big investment, like every eight weeks, just taking one week off. Um, but it helped them also to do it as a team. Before Atlassian had a system like the 20% time from Google, I don't know if you heard about it, just like taking 20% off. Didn't work because people were just like, doing things, and then the team just like said, okay, but we have sprint goals, so why aren't you working on the sprint goals? Um, but yeah, I have, I have the possibility to work 20% on my... So we fixed that by saying um, we're doing it as a team, taking, taking a whole week off. So that is our 20% time, even though it's not 20%. Um, but this innovation week is, of course, a big investment, five hours uh, a week, so it's 7.7 .7 hours uh, of improvement. You can make your own calculation, your own formula, but it is important to invest time in discovery, right? To invest in discovery time. You need to just like learn, know, improve your products. Um, this is all done by, by experimentation. But the biggest, biggest thing that is makes you an effective developer is work on what matters. So I recently browsed the internet and I found this great new uh, functionality in a, in a car, right? So you can control the car by gestures. Isn't that great? So you can just like turn the volume up and down. You can actually even also just like pinch zoom into something. It's, that's so cool, so great. Why did they build that, right? What's well, different than doing a touch screen? There's probably a lot of teams involved in that because there's a camera behind the hand that's just like scanning the hand and scanning the movements of the hand. And why did they build that? Why didn't they just like say, okay, touchscreen can do the job. We have bigger fish to fry or bigger things to do, right? What's the problem they wanted to solve that a touchscreen couldn't solve? What's the problem? It's just like right in front of the screen, so it's just like a few centimeters away. I don't know. Um, and we don't ask ourselves the question too often, like, what is really the problem we want to solve here? We always go, often go into the solution already and say, oh, we need to build this download button so people can download this, uh, the, the, uh, the list as a C CSV file or Excel file. But what's the problem, really, that we wanted to solve here? Why do we want to solve it? What's the validation data? And what other solutions are out there to solve this 
particular problem. We need to take some more time to think about this. Um, so Atlassian also developed a thing called, they call it the project poster. And they have really uh, thought about this. I think it took three years to come up with all these questions or to, to, to fine tune the questions. So every project that starts there now um, has to start with a project poster. Of course, it's not, it's, not, it's not a poster. It's a confluence page somewhere, right? Um, so they just like start with it. And these are the questions, say, why are we doing this? How do we judge success? What are the possible solutions? Um, validation, like where's the data? Uh, that how is how's the data showing that this is a problem and then looking when you've done it that you are really fixed the problem So you look at the data again and see okay, we fixed it um, and then if it's ready to, to, to be made So start with the project post. It's not only good for just like thinking deeply about the problem as a team So the whole team actually understands what the problem is and why they are doing this feature but also to for, for people that come in and say what are you doing and then you can just like okay Here's the project poster read through it, that it's all in there. And then you break it down into small little user stories, right? So um, let's say this is a user story. As a user, I want a new statistic button so that I can see the number of data sets. Could be a user story for MongoDB so people can see the number of data sets that is in a MongoDB. Um, but also here, like, what's the problem we want to solve? Why are we doing this? We also have to do this with user stories. So say, instead of this, we should say, as just mean, I want to know the number of data sets so that I can play for growth. So maybe if the database grows too much, you have to buy a bigger instance uh, of MongoDB, or you have to just like shard your data into different shards. But this is really the problem that you want to want to want to work on, right? You want to know, you want to plan for growth. You want to see like when is the time that I need a bigger database. Um, so think a little bit more like your users. So. Here are some users here. Just me, developer and training. She wants the button. Great. Then Lucas is a full stack developer. Maybe Lucas wants a command line interface. So just like he can type it in. Um, maybe he's more comfortable with that. So also here, like think like your users. You have different users with uh, maybe they have the same problem, but they solve it differently. Also think a little bit like this. Of course, these are not real users. These are personas. So we made up these persona cards here where we learn a little bit more and feel a little bit more like our users at MongoDB. All right. Now you have all this kind of project posters, right? Now comes the problem of prioritization. And you, you know, who screamed the loudest? You're working on it. That's not the right thing to do. We all know that. So where, what, what, what should you work on? Work on the happy path, right? Where 80% of your users stays if you do products for users. Um, just like work on the happy path because you're fixing things for 80% of, of your use users. If you work on the corner cases, could be also important. I don't want to say that, but try to fix that first. So make your 80% of your users happy. So you can do something like this journey mapping. Maybe you've heard about it, um, where you just like have the journey that's, a, I think, a Confluence journey map that the Confluence team put together. So you have how, how the users go through the software on day one, day two, what issues they have, and how we want to fix that. And then we do it for, for every kind of persona. Great, right? All right, this is a developer conference. Sven, what I'm doing here. I'm just like talking about products. It's not a product manager conference, right? Um, I'm wrong. Sorry. Sorry. That I, I took the wrong turn some, somewhere here. Um, it's all about code, right? We care about code. The product people care about the product, right? Yeah. So I wish engineers spend less time understanding the problem and more time coding. Who said that? Who said that? Nobody ever, right? Nobody says that. We need to understand the problem. Even though we are coders and developers, we need to understand what's the problem of the users. So instead of, and I say, like, if you're a junior developer, maybe you want to care about code, or you should care about code first. But once you get a little bit more, more true, you should care about the product that you build, because this is actually what makes the money for the company, right? Um, so you should become a product engineer. A product engineer. So how do you help actually the product teams to make the product better? You're the bridge between the product people and the code. 
right? So you can go in and do hallway testing. Just like show your software to your coworker and say, how oh, this new functionality, or to another team and say, they, they are actually experts. So just tell them, so we built this functionality. What do you think? Just give feedback before actually the product team goes out there to the users and, 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 and ask the users uh, uh, how, how, how good the software is or if, if it's working for them. Send your developers on support, right? Help them to understand the customers. And it's amazing. Um, at Alassian, they had this program where they sent a developer a week per year on support. It's not too much, right? But Spending a week with real user issues, they came back and said, wow, they have this, this particular problem, and we can fix that in software very, very easily, and I don't know, 20% of the support cases will be easier to handle for the support team, and the users will be happy. So send your developers on support so they actually talk to users and learn the problems that, that your users have day in, day out. And also dive deeper into just like analytics, like how are your users using the software? It's not just the product managers that need to understand that. We are actually, uh, we are actually down at the wire and we can just like do that as software developers. We can help them to understand the behavior of the, of the users better and improve that. All that makes us actually effective software developers. Um, code as a team, right? So we are working as, as, as one team on the code. Continuously learn, right? We, we need to just like, our, our industry is just like continuously moving on and we, to, we need not to understand everything really uh, deeply, but we need to understand what's out there and how it can help us. Um, experiment, try to run some experiments, right? Um, do coding sessions, uh, do, do maybe hackathons or just like try things out, get your hands on stuff. Um, that you probably is not your product and your day-to-day -day, uh, job, but it's, it's important. Um, and also work on really what matters, what turns the needle, what's important for the customers. Now, I've been talking now for 55 minutes uh, here, so you might think like Sven, it's, for me it's still a little bit like wee -wee 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 -wee, being effective, right? Um, it's, and it, it is like this. It's, some things works for you, some things doesn't work for you. It's a little bit, it's not just uh, this is the rule and here how we do it. Uh, you have to try things out and you have to come up with your, with your own software development effectiveness. Um, efficiency is super straight on because you can measure things, you can make it more efficient. And don't get me wrong. Efficiency is also important, right? We need to be also efficient to just like automate stuff, right? We do need to do some automation um, and automate as much as we can. Um, we need to know maybe the command line makes us more effective, like if you use the command line uh, tools more. Or just like doing processes, how we handle, handle, pro handle uh, the work directly. So also this makes us more effective. And this, we, we got easily dragged to effectiveness. Um, where we also should look more at, uh, as, uh, sorry, efficiency, and we should look more at effectiveness. So, efficiency is about like getting more stuff done. We can get more stuff done, more, more, more issues fixed, more features implemented, where effectiveness is about like getting the right stuff done that turns the needle, that helps the users, that helps maybe also the company. In other words, like this is about, efficiency is about output, where effectiveness is about outcome. So one thing, think outcome first, be effective, and then get shit done. Thank you very much. I just, I've, I've just let one more ask. Um, we are this small little startup from Spain, as I said. We want to learn more about the local markets. So if you could help us just like filling out a survey, um, we won't spam you, guaranteed. Uh, so if you help us filling out the survey, and uh, we guarantee you, we send you a T-shirt for that, um, a nice developer T-shirt. Um, so thank you for that. All right. Here you go. So time to question. We still have two minutes to go, so please raise your hand if you have a question. And yes, if you are online, please put your, your question on YouTube. Oh, if you are here, let's to raise your hand. You can put your question here too as well. When is beer o'clock? Oh, was <laughs> that a real question? <laughs> I think everyone is just like thirsty and want to get 
Yeah, yes. everybody's looking for the beer. That's fine. I'm hanging around too at the beers, so just catch me. Um, so again, thank you very much. Thank you for coming and have a great evening. Thanks. <laughs>